and with the guidance of Balkan audiences. So, uh, next note, please. I don't, yeah. oh. It works. Yes. Okay. okay, so this, this is. This one. Yes, this is one. Thank you. Uh, this is the painting that was his first truly big success in his career as a professional artist. It was exhibited for the first time in the on the annual 1882 annual of yeah Academy exhibition in Vienna, and Ivanovich exhibited it as his final graduation work. Uh, the wounded Montenegrin was received with high praise by audiences critics critics alike, earning Ivanovich a first place award and later a scholarship granted by austrian Hungarian government. This further enabled him to gain a first proper contract with the French gallery in London to produce a series of oriental style paintings. Um, mostly with the teams of Balkan life. And it is precisely uh, travels to the, uh, travels to the Orient and with the aid of his newly found funding uh, that he managed to gain more experience and knowledge on local visual culture and tradition. And as a side note, I will be using Orient, uh, when I say Orient from now on, it mostly means Balkans. I know Orient is a very big construct and not a real place, but yes, when I say Orient, I mean strictly Balkan countries and surrounding territories. Uh, now, um, it happens that some of the works by Ivanovich were so popular that he had to paint multiple identical canvases of the same scene, and thus today we have four versions of the Wounded Montreal by Ivanovich. So, uh, this painting depicts a wounded youth surrounded by a group of peasants in a humble interior and as you can see, they're all dressed in shabby hands and clothes. The wounded man is surrounded by armed warriors, where a fair-haired girl, presumably a lover or a relative, weeps on her knees by his side. And among the peasants, you can see uh, this slightly uh, separated figure of an old man who is uh, stricken with grief and reaches for the uh, youth on the floor. Now, the oriental aspects of the, this painting are obvious. You can see the colorful folk attire, dirt floors, and utensils hanging on the wall. And uh, the scene itself is an image of sort of a tender aftermath of cruelty. And it's implied that this sort of brutality is a regular occurrence as it happens in the Orient. Um, a curious detail worth mentioning is that Ivanovich did not assign towels to his works. Uh, as he felt that if a painting was well composed, viewers would be able to deduce the title themselves. Thus, the majority of the artist's works are referred to by a number of different titles, and this painting, apart from the one in Montenegro, also appears under the titles of the one in Herzegovinian, the one in Bosnia, and Sad Encounter, Sad Farewell, and Unsuccessful Banditry. Yes, it is. Uh, this next painting is another one that was um, painting during one of his study travels to the Balkans, and it was painted for the French gallery, uh, which is, again, remember, his, his, his first big contract. And as the rest of the Orientalist Balkan scenes he was painting during this time, it was well received and praised by English audiences and critics. Now, uh, the painting is set in a typical rural 19th century household, and it shows the woman of the family adorning a young bride with a jewelry taken from an old wooden chest. You can see uh, next to the chest that stands a little girl holding a copper tray, which also contains several items of jewelry. To the far right, three uh, women are seen making a garland with fresh flowers while uh, kind of giddily um, whispering among themselves. Uh, the room in which the women have gathered is pretty modestly furnished uh, with low ceiling, low, low worn carpets, and plain dusty walls. The bride is dressed in a traditional garb with a gold necklace around her neck. and. You can see, I don't know, the resolution is kind of iffy, but uh, imagine delicately embroidered slippers on her feet. Uh, the artist's signature, uh, which he often tended to sort of translate to a foreign language, in this uh, case, she, he kind of Germanicized it as P. which you can't really see it, but trust me, it's there. Uh, it should be seen on the bottom right. Uh, there are, again, several uh, versions of this painting as well, and he actually tended to um, have different signatures of different versions of the same painting, which is curious, you know, but more on that some other time. And um, both of these works show scenes from life in the Balkans through noticeably Western gaze, and Ivanovich no doubt always had in mind the audiences that we presented with his work. During his studious travels across the Orient, he depicted, he came across many things that simply wouldn't go over well if presented as paintings to Western audiences. 
the 19th century witnessed a series of uprisings and wars throughout the Balkan Peninsula, which yielded horrific results with a high number of deaths. However, Ivan was firmly to choose not to depict the true brutality uh, of these events. He paints scenes that are carefully smooth and, in a sense, sterilized from any truly terrifying details, thus avoiding critical realism and removing the possibility of opening problematic discourses about the actual events that were happening behind the paintings. His carefully constructed theater that is shown through paintings like the woman Montenegrin or Colonel of Blood or a Traitor all show very dignified and filtered versions of the true events that were happening at the moment. This is completely in sync with Orientalist credo depicting the imagined and idealized letter, which was in a sense necessary for Ivanovic's works to be successful among Western audiences, and the artist was well aware of it. Nevertheless, he attempted to compromise with the necessary Orientalist aerialism by incredible precision to details. This is possibly why his works are still largely loved among the center and periphery alike, since one side sees his work as the exotic image of the other, and the other side sees it as a heroic and romantic depiction of their own culture and history. The precision in details that Ivan was to great here to achieve was enough for the Balkans to identify with and feel well represented by it. Uh, now I will share several of Yovanovic's works that were commissioned by Serbian institutions. These two paintings were commissioned by the Serbian Orthodox Church and the Royal Serbian Government, respectively. They were both commissioned with intentions of representing Serbia on international exhibitions, thus again showing them to foreign audiences. But the difference here is that the depicted periphery actually dictated the way it wanted to be represented. So the first painting is the migration of the Serbs, um, which uh, depicts the great Serbian migration of uh, 1690, led by Archbishop Ar uh, Arseny III, uh, and they were shown playing old Serbia. It was uh, commissioned in 1895 by Georgi Brankovic, the Patriarch of Karlovci, to be displayed at the following year's Budapest Millennium Exhibition. Uh, the first version of uh, Ivan was completed in 1896, so the year afterwards, and presented to the Patriarch Georgi later that year. However, the picture was dissatisfied and asked Ivanovic to adjust his work to conform to certain church views on the migration. Uh, and though Ivanovic made the changes relatively quickly, he couldn't complete them in time for the painting to be displayed in Budapest, and it therefore had to be unveiled later. So uh, Ivanovic went on to complete a total of four versions of the painting again, three of which arrived today. Uh, this kind of painting actually holds pretty iconic status in Serbian popular culture, and several authors refer to it as one of Ivanovic's finest achievements. Uh, this is the other one I was showing you, uh, the proclamation of Dusan Slav Codex, um, and it depicts a very important historical event that took place in Skopje in 1349, when Emperor Dusan Leonic um, introduced Serbia's earliest surviving law codex. The painting depicts uh, Dusan uh, exiting the church with his wife Yelena and son Ursh shortly after publicly announcing the new law codex. And there are our patriarch Yonikie and the magnate Jovanoru Olga, as well as many other members of the clergy and nobility. The emperor and his entourage are watched by modern nobles, as you can see, knights and commoners. The knights lower their swords at Dushan's feet as a sign of respect and submission. And the entire atmosphere of festivity reflects in bright color palettes and plenty of lights, as well as the scene of progressive figures, yet pretty well composed and, and uh, you can see later, uh, Ivanovic actually thought this was one of his finest compositions, uh, most harmonious. Uh, but the royal Serbian government, uh, when, it, when they commissioned the painting, uh, they intended for it to be displayed at the following year's uh, world exhibition in Paris, that would take place in 1900. Uh, and when it was originally commissioned, the painting was intended to depict Dushan's um, 1346 coronation as Emperor of Serbia, but after some consulting, Yovanovic decided against painting that scene and opted to depict the proclamation of his law codex instead. Uh, however, the painting is still kind of mm, sort of mistakenly described as depicting the coronation. Um, but you can see anyway that Yovanovic paid a great deal of attention to historical detail in preparation for the work. Um, and it began. Uh, shortly after the commission, so in uh, 1899, when he traveled all over Vienna, Constantinople, Venice, Skopje, Kosovo, and Tokyo, he gathered a lot of um, uh, 
evidence in various elements of traditional visual culture that put ATM in creating as authentic an image as possible. So the first version was finished in time for the whole fair, but he actually, if I recall, yeah, uh, there were about seven more versions of this painting, or seven in total. Uh, it was truly a, a considerable um, success, and a very huge number of art historians and critics actually consider this work by Ivanovich in particular to be one of his finest works, and Ivanovich himself claimed that the painting was his most beautiful composition. So, um, Ivanovich was, yes, Ivanovich was a painter that was born and raised in Balkans, but his artistic career, career <coughs> simply grew him into sort of a detached observer of the peninsula. He traveled and studied the traditions, customs, and people themselves, but he seemed to never truly fathom the concept of the Balkans that he painted. He always looked at it from the other culture of the West, and always from a mentality of center. Whether he worked in Vienna, in Munich, London, Paris, USA, or at home in Serbia, he seemed to perceive himself equally as much of a guest wherever he went. Nevertheless, this soon be perceived as inherently negative, as this odd relationship between the painter and his paintings uh, of the culture of the homeland may very well seem negatively imagined or even objectifying for the sake of entertaining the West. However, the fact is that certain works by Ivanovich are still perceived as pinnacles of Serbian history and heroic ideals materialized in visual culture. Uh, uh, art historian and uh, previous curator of National Museum of Serbia, uh, Nikola Kusovac, recalls his visits to China during the 90s, and he says that um, nearly every family home had some kind of reproduction of Ivanovich's paintings, migration of Serbs, and the proclamation of uh, visual folk context. Those and similar works by Ivanovich were supposedly a part of generational education about national, about uh, national culture and history. So this shows us that works by Ivanovich are dual importance. They are oriental paintings, yes. They show us what was attracted to painting exhibits and see exhibited and purchased. However, it also shows us how the depicted peoples from Balkan appreciated this kind of representation. Johannes did strike for visual authenticity, especially when it came to the paintings referencing Serbian history. So it's understandable for these works to have achieved this level of, of appreciation and some even say cult following among the Balkan bravery. And in the end, even though Johannes' Oriental's views on Balkan may be a construct, construct, they are still an integral part of Serbian national identity. Johannes always seemed to strive to be neutral and even unterminable. Uh, while painting exotic windows into Balkan's everyday life, as well as heroic and glorious moments in history of the same Orient. Um, and his works appealed uh, to thirsty eyes of the bourgeois center, but at the same time, it elevated the patriotic spirit of the small nations of the periphery. It was a troublesome track task, to be sure, but Pajalano, it was an extraordinarily sharp observer of his audience, and he was ever aware of the current trends and wants of the times he lived and worked in. Thank you for your time. Nina, thank you a lot. Uh, now we will hear our colleague, art historian, Niona Muska. She is, um, she's actually from Zagreb, so you didn't have to travel long. <laughs> uh, no, but I did, I did manage to make a lot of mistakes by traveling here. Okay. Obviously, a few words about that. Okay, teaching at the uh, Academy of Fine Arts in Zagreb, and actually teaching to international students. So that's as we can see, can be very challenging. So we will talk about that concerning the national history, not national art history. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. So it is indeed challenging, but it also, uh, as every challenge, it also opens up new perspective, and uh, hopefully it's something that uh, will also raise uh, your interest as well. But prior to me actually commencing, I have to uh, mention a few disclaimers. Um, uh, these disclaimers actually constitute my apology to you, and that is something that I hinted there in the introduction, and that is the fact that I came here uh, now using this microphone almost as an intellectual prop because I forgot to bring my notes. Uh, without my notes, this implies that I will be committing a horrible crime to the here present audience, and that is that I will be turning 
uh, back to the presentation itself, because for me, currently presents the source of coherence, which I actually read very much. And also another uh, very short apology um, relates to the fact that even though I have been teaching this particular course for the last four years, for the last uh, two years, ever since the beginning of the pandemic, and that's uh, since March 2020, I have, doing, I have been doing that online. So this actually constitutes uh, a very embodied experience uh, in a very basic sense for me. So my stage fright uh, without my notes is very, very high. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, hopefully um, this uh, will, uh, as a challenge, also uh, not just uh, produce omissions, but also uh, perhaps uh, a relief for the audience, because I am aware of the fact that this is the, the uh, last uh, talk uh, of uh, this uh, very long day. Uh, and uh, also um, another thing that I need to make a mention of uh, is the fact that uh, for those of you who uh, have been uh, interested enough or kind enough to read my summary, uh, you must have noticed that it is indeed riddled with some high concepts and um, references to various fields. Uh, today I will be making a mention of only several of those. Um, I will, uh, because it was my intention actually with my notes, uh, to present this uh, as a kind of case study. Um, in this case study, I will be making uh, references to what uh, the canon is, or at least what uh, recent scholarship uh, says about it. Uh, then I will say I will be saying a few words about the national canon and what possible challenges that produces, uh, and uh, then I will present my course uh, basically as a case study using three examples uh, with which I uh, which I discuss uh, with uh, my students. And as to those high concepts and references, I hope to present them uh, in. Uh, an appropriate manner in uh, the paper, uh, which uh, I'm told uh, is forthcoming. Okay, uh, so um, uh, to start with, uh, the course uh, that I teach at the Academy of uh, Fine Arts uh, is titled Art and Culture in Croatia. I mentioned that it's been uh, for the last four years that I've been teaching it. Um, um, just a few sentences surrounding the context of it. Uh, in the competing uh, university market, uh, for a number of reasons, it was decided that uh, students uh, who used to come from around the world uh, are actually in need of a theoretical course, uh, because I teach at the Academy of Fine Arts, of course, uh, and uh, that uh, means uh, that most of uh, the courses that students take are actually practical courses. Uh, so it was decided that uh, a, a, a theoretical course is uh, necessary. Uh, so this was a kind of a, a compromise solution, something perhaps I might uh, talk a little bit uh, about uh, uh, in, the, um, in the discussion uh, afterwards. And also another thing that uh, presents a challenge and something that I also hinted at in the summary uh, is the fact that it's not just a compulsory course to exchange students, it's also uh, an elective course to the students of the Academy of Fine Arts. So to strike a balance, uh, between the fields of references for those two uh, is one of the main challenges that I have uh, to uh, face. Uh, okay, uh, so moving on to what is the canon. When I started researching this in order to provide a coherent talk uh, for this uh, talk, um, I, because canon as um, an operative category has been around for quite a while, it has been around since uh, certainly since uh, I was a student uh, here uh, in Zagreb, um, and uh, it uh, did, uh, it did, uh, um, it, 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 it did strike me uh, as odd uh, that in fact uh, some serious uh, theoretical or uh, um, uh, uh, critical studies of what uh, the canon is uh, actually date back to only recently. That is not to say that this, um, this, uh, as I said, uh, this uh, particular, this particular, sorry, 
this uh, particular notion or uh, a term has not been around for quite a while. In fact, uh, it was uh, first uh, it was first praised and it was first challenged by feminist art uh, history that was uh, sometime. Uh, in the 1970s, Linda Nocklin, to mention just the first and foremost name, uh, who laid the groundwork uh, for a later uh, American scholarship, uh, which was uh, very soon picked up uh, by uh, British uh, feminist art historians and uh, so on and so forth. But not to go uh, into uh, this uh, any further, I decided to illustrate this point uh, with, uh, with something completely different because uh, it's once again, a reference to the fact that I teach to art students. So I decided uh, to uh, choose an example of how um, canon uh, can um, be, uh, how, how an effort can be made to um, deconstruct, let's, let's say, it, uh, uh, deconstruct the canon uh, by using artistic uh, means. Now, I won't go into explaining very much uh, about this uh, very uh, complex uh, installation, uh, but uh, certainly is a, a rare effort when an artist actually, with collaborators, of course, uh, took an uh, effort to make, um, to make uh, 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 inscriptions uh, into the canon, of course, uh, dealing uh, with various uh, aspects of otherhood when it comes to uh, when it comes to femininity, be it in terms of representation or in terms of uh, absences uh, uh, from it. Uh, now, uh, coming uh, back to uh, that uh, part uh, which uh, has to do with some serious academic references uh, when it comes to the study of the uh, canon, uh, this uh, particular uh, publication, which uh, I'm happy to say is actually open source, so it's uh, accessible, uh, is uh, one that I will be uh, using just uh, shortly as a, uh, as a point of uh, reference. Uh, even though I don't uh, personally necessarily agree with everything which is stated here, I decided uh, to include it here uh, only to uh, somewhat challenge it, inflect it and deconstruct it uh, by the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, so I will not uh, read uh, all uh, uh, these um, because I don't think uh, that we have time enough for that. Uh, I will just say that the canon uh, constitutes a system of uh, references, of course, artistic uh, references, and basically it's a series of valued objects. And I would very much uh, like to draw your attention to uh, the, uh, the uh, not the last century, but one before the last, uh, where um, Herbert Klocker, who is a German uh, scholar, uh, uh, makes the claim that there is no set canon in the strict sense, but a tradition of canon formation which is characteristic of uh, Western uh, culture. Uh, this is uh, a kind of claim which uh, basically says that uh, if the canon is always in the process of negotiation, that is always in uh, the process of flux, that it, it, it basically constitutes a kind of homeostasis that is always uh, being changed. So this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, 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 reflects Anthony Giddens' uh, notion of, uh, of what the homeostasis is. But uh, I will leave this uh, for the time being and uh, come back to it uh, in the very end of the presentation. But I will, however, um, um, make mention of the fact that paradoxically enough, uh, when we start researching, academically researching this notion of the canon, uh, there is uh, one uh, source uh, that I found to be very rewarding, uh, and that is the Art History Pedagogy and Practice, which is, uh, which is an open source, uh, once again, uh, an open source uh, journal, uh, which is published um, uh, by the City University of New York. And uh, in its own, I think it, uh, it has been around since 2016, so it has only seven editions. And in these seven editions, if you search through its database, you will find 25 entries uh, related to the canon. In fact, its 2022 edition is solely dedicated to, uh, to the issue of what canon is 
what the canon is uh, for art historical uh, studies uh, today. And I'm actually looking forward to it, hopefully, to include it in the paper because many of uh, these articles have not uh, been uh, published yet. But uh, the main claim and the main scoop from there would be that the canon is a threshold concept for art history. And I think this is indicative of the fact uh, that uh, it is those who are teachers, those who are basically at the forefront of uh, the production of the canon, those who produce uh, the canon, uh, are those who uh, are uh, dealing uh, with it. Now, this is something that, uh, of course, uh, you all know, even though I have to just make a, a, a kind of disclaimer, it's almost a footnote, uh, which I found to be interesting. Uh, when I first started teaching international students, uh, this was, of course, uh, the uh, background, because, of course, I am teaching the national canon against the background of the Western canon. And I, I thought it uh, to go without saying that they, they would know about uh, this particular uh, book. Uh, however, uh, it was at least that, that was the case in my first generation, nobody knew. Uh, and students came from around, mostly from Europe, but around the world. So, of course, there are a number of uh, these staple books. Uh, this is not uh, the only one. I just uh, decided to, um, uh, I just decided uh, to uh, include it uh, here uh, as a reference to a great many things that perhaps uh, I will skip uh, some of those uh, and say uh, and uh, mention uh, once again something that we all already know, but I think it needs to be uh, iterated and, re and reiterated. And that is the fact that something that we title history of art, and there, has been, there have been attempts, uh, for example, necessarily in relation to Janssen's history of art, but for example, in relation to Bromley's uh, history of art, to um, rewrite them as histories of art in an effort to make it more global, but of course history of art stands for Western tradition and this is not uh, even on the cover, of course, it's, it is a kind of subtitle, but it goes without saying that history of art is something that uh, is related to artistic production in the tiniest fraction of uh, the world, uh, mainly just uh, Europe, mainly just Western Europe, and to some extent uh, uh, since uh, early modern times, it's called an early modern times, but basically we mostly mean like the 20th, mean the 20th century uh, in uh, the North American uh, continent. Uh, I will leave it at that. Um, and uh, coming back to, uh, or not coming back to, but finally reaching uh, the notion of the national canon, that is something that I am teaching. So art history in the territory of uh, the Republic of Croatia, starting from, from prehistory, and of course with a strong slant towards uh, contemporary art, because uh, this uh, is um, the, 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 these are this is the uh, the target audience, the uh, art makers themselves, who are of course more, mostly interested uh, in this uh, particular in this particular uh, in this particular uh, temporality. Of um, artistic production. Now, the National Canon, I've had very extensive notes uh, in which uh, basically I claim that to defend the National Canon, that's a, a, a very, um, a very difficult uh, intellectual endeavor. It's very difficult to defend it from a theoretical position, uh, uh, something that uh, all those who actually uh, undertake uh, the effort to write a national art history know and always claim in the introduction how difficult it was and uh, to make these choices, uh, not just to make selections and choices, but also to theoretically defend uh, what uh, they are doing. And uh, as it rests upon ideas of trans-historical continuity, continuity of uh, territory that is basically non-existent anywhere in the world, uh, also political beads uh, that uh, the art history is written about uh, uh, present-day countries which are which have historically been uh, constituted as political uh, countries or those that uh, rest upon national identity as the unifying factor, uh, but mostly it has to do uh, with uh, some uh, general. I mean, this is very very generalised, of course, uh, with uh, the, the projections of of of, of ethnic. Uh, continuity projections of ethnicity into a very uh, distant past. Uh, of course, uh, I will exemplify that uh, very shortly, and the exclusion of others, uh, that goes without saying. 
And I decided I know that this man is very good looking, but uh, it basically fell into my lap, so to speak, uh, the other day. I really needed to include it uh, because I, it, it, it testifies uh, in, 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 in so many uh, red dots uh, as to how skewed the perspective of the national canon is. It, it's bound to be uh, that way. It, it cannot be. Uh, otherwise. Uh, so um, this, I think, uh, is a, a very, very good illustration of the challenges uh, uh, that uh, anybody who deals with it um, um, uh, needs to uh, face. And also another thing I wanted to make mention of, uh, and that is that uh, in the uh, aforementioned uh, book, uh, which was um, in, in, in the previous uh, slide, so the Art History and Visual Studies in Europe Translation of Discourses and National Frameworks, there is a very fine article by uh, a British scholar, his name is Matthew Rampley, who undertook uh, an effort to uh, write about national art histories, and I can't, because I don't have my notes here, uh, exactly quote the title of his article, but basically, uh, it's about uh, national art histories basically dominating uh, art historical scholarship in something that he calls New Europe. I mean, he puts it on the quotation marks. Uh, but uh, this, I think, is very indicative of the processes of exclusion that still exist uh, in terms of something that can easily uh, be uh, that can easily be uh, dubbed simply as uh, Central and Eastern Europe on the one hand, but on the other hand, it really testifies uh, to uh, the facts and to, to, to some facts I mentioned, and also uh, to uh, all those things that are summed up in this very very short uh, first entry, and that is uh, the idea of continuity. Uh, a kind of legitimation uh, for the existence of the nation state also uh, is uh, embodied in, um, in, 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 in an idea of, uh, in an idea of, in, in, in an actual edition of national art history. Okay, Mary, Sandra. Okay, <laughs> you don't have the notes, so you don't have to go. Oh my goodness, I, I will speed up, I will speed up, I will speed up. Okay, current information and historical process may occur in times of uh, when a society is in crisis. Um, hmm. uh, certainly, I mean, forgive me for explaining what structuralism is, this uh, remains uh, from my uh, notes to students, uh, but let's say that structuralism uh, is, uh, is, is an intellectual, intellectual uh, 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 horizon of the mid uh, 20th century, and uh, this book uh, and its cover uh, very much uh, reflect uh, those things that I, I mentioned before, and that is the fact uh, that when national identity is somehow, when any kind of identity feels itself to be in crisis, it needs to reach uh, some, uh, it needs uh, to uh, produce a, a canon in order to project some kind of uh, coherence and some kind of uh, uniformity. Uh, structuralism, I mentioned for the fact that it's very difficult to operate um, and to uh, try to deconstruct the uh, canon from this position because it's, it's, it's uh, of course, very, uh, uh, very, very metaphysical and it really uh, is about um, discerning or reading from every single artifact produced uh, within a chronotope, so uh, within the space and a time to be representative of the wider whole. I will uh, I will skip these because uh, these, even though uh, these covers testify to some major uh, intellectual uh, issues uh, related to uh, what uh, art historical scholarship has been addressing uh, in recent years, uh, these are uh, admirable uh, uh, later efforts, but as uh, any um, national art history, they include a number of omissions, and uh, not just, of course, intellectual omissions, but even in those uh, categories that constitute uh, the national. Yeah. And now uh, I will absolutely finish, not uh, basically. Uh, I have a number of examples that I didn't make mention of, and I'm very, very sorry for that. Uh, but uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for your attention. I would be very, very happy to talk about these particular examples because they are basically a testimony 
uh, to uh, the challenges uh, that can be resolved and how these can actually contribute to the global debate uh, about what the canon is, how it can be rewritten, how it can be challenged, how uh, center and periphery uh, uh, constitute challenging categories that are actually can be very, very operative and very paradoxical uh, ways, but I will uh, have to uh, deal with that uh, some other time. So uh, I apologize and thank you very much for your attention. Okay, now you can uh, stay here, take a little seat. Uh, Maybe also, uh, do we have any questions in the audience or comments? I know there are teachers here in the audience. Maybe they can say something. I have one question for Mina. Okay, here's one question for Mina. You mentioned that Jovanovic used different um, uh, uh, kind of forms of his uh, last name in his. Uh, could you explain it a bit more? Absolutely. Um, that was actually. Uh, wait, wait. Uh, so you can put it back. Yeah, yeah, um, um, that was actually what prompted me to explore the entire um, dichotomy of um, his um, works painted for the West and for the, so to speak, uh, regional Serbian audience, because it was really incredible how many variations of his signature he has. Uh, I counted about eight uh, translations of his own, of his um, last name. So he was Ivanovich, he was Ioannovich, he was... The, the spellings really uh, show how, how he attempted to adapt to uh, different audiences for different um, art markets. Uh, since he had a special surname signature for London audiences, for um, the entire uh, territory of uh, Central Europe. And uh, he actually made a point to uh, pretty much mainly used Cyrillic scripts when he painted for Serbian audiences and for Serbian government, for Serbian church. He really tried to use uh, the Serbian letters. So um, I think that's, um, that's kind of um, a really good um, indicative of how the uh, painter wants to exhibit not only what he painted, but himself as well. So he kind of adapts to uh, the audience, to who he's showing to. He's adapting not only his painting, but his his signature and in a sense his own self. So, uh, yeah, I think um, it, I'm actually, uh, I've been talking with my mentor about writing an entire paper on it because uh, not, he um, wasn't the only painter that did it. For example, Vlaka Bukovac also did it. He, he had many variations of his name. He changed his name entirely. And for example, Slavic Shimano also did it, used the different scripts. And I think that's a really fascinating topic to continue on. Any other questions, comments? No? Okay. It's just a, a, a question commentary for Nina. Uh, uh, no, sorry. You have very similar so names. So. Um, uh, I was thinking about the yeah. Yes, what do you think? Okay. <laughs> um, I was thinking about Real Spaces by David Summers. Do you know the book? It's, um, it's a, a, an immense enterprise trying to, um, to deal with an anti canonical approach to art history. Um, and it is a lifetime endeavor, endeavor, I think it's the right pronunciation. Um, and um, it's, it tries to, 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 um, to uh, uh, comprise different art histories from another continent and a, a different kind of approach. It's called Real Spaces, and it was very much debated by, uh, namely, James Elkins, 
you, you know the book is our history global i know the book sorry i didn't recognize the title it, yeah it was it was an editor but endeavor and i would have made a reference in the second part of the presentation to yes i know i read it since to me james, james elkins actually he was uh, here uh, two months ago he was a guest here yes and uh, i'm not critical also so he's a, uh, he's, he's a theorist of art criticism and such is is, is is very influential and very interesting to me I know, I, I'm actually uh, quite interested in, in that and I was actually going to uh, make reference to the fact that this uh, kind of uh, global turn which is taking place, interestingly enough it was some 15 years ago uh, that the book uh, was published and um, uh, it resonated that basically it caught on much much later and what I find very interesting is that uh, um, during the time when it was published what resonated let's say in the art historical community was mainly uh, the, uh, the kind of uh, um, um, promotion of new methodologies uh, that dominated basically the discipline and uh, for the last one can see this in SIFA conferences for example and for the last uh, several conferences we can see that uh, it's not so much about methodology but including uh, the uh, multi-directional uh, influences and the multitudes of voices uh, and, and basically, uh, and, and everything that these global these uh, efforts, um, as, as such as that one by James Elkins, advocated for, are uh, kind of taking place, but not perhaps uh, within this overreaching frame, but somehow individually uh, and uh, partially, and and I'd say uh, more naturally, uh, whatever that uh, means. So that's my general take on that. I'm sorry, did I interrupt you? Did you want to say no, anything? No, no, no. I was just going to ask if. Could it be possible, considering these works and the question by James Elkins and this uh, major work by David Sanders, to 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 do a, a, a global and a national uh, to teach national art history as you're talking about with a global approach? Is this possible? I, I ask myself that a lot because I also teach and I'm always trying to deconstruct what Chinese happening. Yes, thank you very much for your question. That's, the, of course, the question that I keep asking myself. And the answer in one of these examples was that, of course, it's situated knowledge that I teach. But I try to use, uh, to kind of paraphrase uh, uh, W.T.J. Mitchell, I try to use the uh, images as a sort or as a source of value rather than evaluation. And basically, from these uh, sources, uh, address global issues. Uh, of course, the, the way that I perceive them through my uh, situated knowledge. So uh, these example for, uh, examples that I had, for example, uh, were about uh, how Neanderthals are depicted, what this can tell us about gender relations, and another of examples, well, well let's, let's not go uh, into them, but yes, it was this uh, uh, relation between the local and the global that I'm trying uh, to address, of course, uh, with all of uh, these disclaimers, uh, related to the fact that my knowledge is, is very much situated uh, somewhere very near that old uh, centre and of course uh, not uh, not really having much understanding of, of the vast variety of, of perspectives about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Miola. Thank you, Nina. Any other questions or comments? No, we can wrap it up. Okay, uh, day number one. Uh, I say it's finished. Uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you all people online for your attention and see you tomorrow very early. 9 I think. Thank you very much. <laughs>